Hello, and welcome to Story Hour with Miss Barbara. This story is the last in my series of stories from Calhoun Road, a farm in the 1930s and 40s. And this one is Ma's story. My memories of Ma are mainly audio. Her voice had this sonorous quality that reminded me of linoleum. As long as Pa was alive, Ma seemed invisible. I don't really have any memories of her of that time, except in the background, emptying Pa's cans of tobacco juice. But I saw a picture of her when she was 16, and I was just astounded at her dark-haired beauty. Her name was Martha Mary Martinson then, and she was 100% Norwegian. Pa was German, and they used to fight about that a lot, her Norwegian-ness. Ironically, it's the one th element of my heritage, that one quarter Norwegian that I'm most proud of. Go Vikings! But, um, the only picture I have of her childhood is from a short autobiography she wrote, and she tells of sitting on the porch on a Sunday, watching people go to church, and feeling a loneliness inside and a longing in her soul, an emptiness. But she found what she was seeking through Pa. Pa's family was Catholic, and the story goes that Pa said he would marry Ma or Mar Martha if she would turn Catholic. And Martha said she would marry John if he bought her a new dress. So John bought her a new dress and she became a Catholic. But she didn't really start out going to church every Sunday right away. But eventually she grew to be very devout praying her rosary in her rocking chair and kneeling to say her prayers for a long time, Gladys remembers. Now, most of this story comes from Gladys, her second youngest daughter. And um, Gladys, mainly rem her main memory of Ma is that she was the hardest worker she ever knew. Now, Gladys herself was not close to Ma, who was 37 when she was born. Ma, Gladys remembers sitting between Ma and Pa in the front seat of the truck on the way to church and being careful not to touch Ma because she knew that she didn't love her. It was like sitting next to a stranger, Gladys would later remember. But Gladys never held that against Ma. She said she was a good mother and she was just happy that there were some of her daughters that she was close to. In Gladys's words, my memory of Ma is of work. She never played cards with us. She never went to a movie, not even the free movie that we went to once a week in Butler. She never had any friends or ever went visiting. She never had her married kids um, to visit. Well, maybe once. When Pa's family came to visit, she worked cooking for them. When she wasn't washing by hand from a scrub board the first 25 years, she was ironing or sewing or cleaning or working in the field or yard she canned and baked. She never drank or smoked. She never danced or partied. She did spring cleaning and fall cleaning, which included washing the ceiling and the walls. She was a very nervous person, apparently, when she brought down the box of summer and winter clothes and there were new things in there that the girls hadn't seen before. They got all excited and this made her nervous. She would always fall asleep 
in her rocking chair after supper. But Ma did go with Pa and a few of the kids. They had to take turns with that. For the weekend to Woodville, Wisconsin. Once a year, in June sometime after the crops were in, to see her sister, Aunt Cena, and Uncle Lou. They took old Highway 12 and went through the Wisconsin Dells in Eau Claire. It was a six hour journey. Ma, oh, Gladys says, we stopped at the roadside where the Dells was prettiest for lunch. Ma made brownies and all kinds of good stuff. Aunt Cena had a big dairy farm. Everything was neat and tidy, not like our place where the machinery, machinery stood all over the yard and everything was junky, except Ma's lawn and garden. Apparently, that flower garden was a showcase I think it says a lot about Ma, her sensitivity to beauty, her skill at growing things, her industry, and her money-making savvy. You bet she was upset when Pa didn't give her all the money from her flower sales. Gladys's big regret was that she couldn't go back and see that garden later in life when she could have appreciated it more. At the time, she hated having to stand there in the dusk with the mosquitoes, getting stung by bees, on her free time, having to hold out her arms while Ma cut gladiolas and put them in them for Pa to take to market. Looking back though, she remembers, our lawn was like a picture there were peonies, rose bushes, snowball bushes, bridal wreath, and a catalpa tree that grew long pods and had flowers we put on our fingers like caps. She had a big circular garden with tall flowers in the center, then the medium and small. There were zinnias, asters, bluebells, snapdragons, every kind of flower you can think of. It had a white border and she had a rock garden planted with moss roses. One thing Gladys always appreciated about Ma was her cooking. She was a great cook, Gladys would say. The only problem was that most of the things she served, Gladys couldn't eat because for breakfast and supper every day, they had the same thing, bread, and cold cuts, which consisted of head cheese and liverwurst and blood sausage, all things that Gladys could not stomach. She couldn't eat onions either. So Gladys just ate bread and tomato jam. If they ever got store-bought bread and bologna, Gladys thought she was in heaven. But she loved that tomato jam. Later on in life, she got the recipe from Ma and she tried to make it, but it just never turned out the same. Ma's tomato ketchup was outstanding too. She used celery root and the boys used to sneak into the cellar and chug it. Later, Ma made the ketchup really thick so they couldn't do that anymore. Ah, that cellar. It was a showcase, both of the farm and Ma's hard labor. Dug out under the house with a team of horses in 1932 when Gladys was two years old, it was packed in the fall with late cabbage, um, carrots, red beets, potatoes, apples, and other vegetables. And then in the winter and the spring, they ate some and Pa sold some. And then the Gladys and her sisters would have to go into the basement, the dark cellar, 
and peel off the outer leaves of the cabbage heads and put them in bushel baskets. It was a slimy mess. They also stored eggs in the cellar in a barrel of salt. And these eggs would be hard to get out without cracking them. The, the salt would harden into rock-like slabs and they had to scrape away the salt with a spoon carefully until they could get an egg out. There was also a large crock jar in the basement for pickles. And by the time those were ready, the steady supply of vegetables that they ate all day were dwindling. The tomatoes, melons, turnips, kohlrabi, parsnips, uh, green and yellow beans, cucumbers, carrots, which were good for chewing up and spitting at each other, and radishes and peas. So then they would make trips down to the cellar for pickles. There was a big rock on top of a board to hold the pickles down. And Gladys remembers, we had to dig through the scummy water and dill. But they were good. Ma canned everything you could think of. Pa even bought some things like peaches and strawberries. Ma made wine, dandelion and mulberry and other kinds. And she made slippery gems from the ripe cucumbers and crab apple jelly and bread and butter pickles, regular pickles and sauerkraut and that yummy tomato jam and the ketchup, just to name a few. How on earth did Ma do it all? This was on top of the normal cooking and baking and cleaning with no modern conveniences. Sometimes it did get to be too much for her. And during the canning season, one of the girls would have to stay in from the field and stand by the stove and stir the pot that had something in it that was thickening. Or they would have to shred the cabbage for the sauerkraut. Then later, when Loretta was old enough, she was given to Ma as a helper. And this was at the insistence of Ma's sons over, they united against Pa. Up until then, Ma had to work in the fields as well. I guess it pays to have your sons first, even if they do drink up all your ketchup and cause you to have to bake 23 loaves of bread a week. This little detail came out at a family reunion. But working in the fields left its mark on Ma. One time she got sunstroke. And after that, whenever she got too warm, one side of her face would turn beet red and the other side white with a line down the middle. Now, just to give you an idea of the scale of the meals Ma had to prepare, they all ate at this long table in the corner of the kitchen with a bench along the wall for the younger children and chairs on the other side of the table for the older kids. And Pa and Ma sat at the head. They had this big pot for the potatoes and it was black on the bottom because they took off the grate on the stove so that it would cook faster and they put that big pot right on the table and um, also Pa and Ma ate better food than the kids did and this was uh, a custom from the old country Germany. Now for Sunday they had a big meal after church, which was at St. Dominic's in Marcy. They had stewed chicken cooked in a um, Dutch oven, mashed potatoes, gravy, vegetables, dessert. Gladys claimed, I never tasted chicken 
like that since. It was fresh, killed the night before. Saturday night, we took one off the roost, chopped its head off and scalded it in hot water and pulled its feathers off, gutsed it and cut it up. We all knew how to do this and we had to take turns. I tried to do this when I lived in China where they sold the whole chicken defeathered, failed miserably and gave it up. Saturday was spent getting ready for Sunday. Ma baked all day. Besides those 23 loaves of bread, she made crumb cake, deep dish apple pie, coffee cakes, other cakes, including a birthday cake for each child on their birthday. Then the kitchen floor of white hardwood had to be scrubbed. And they took turns doing this on their hands and knees with a scrub brush and a bar of Fells Napa soap. And then after they got it all clean, they covered it with newspaper just to keep it clean until Sunday. Oh, that floor was so nice and white, Gladys remembered. So clean, but not for long. The next Saturday... It was black again. Now, some Sundays, Ma complained about not being able to go to church because she had nothing to wear. I guess that first dress Pa bought was the last. Ma had to wear Pa's old clothes, including his shoes, which were way too big for her. Finally, she began to use her flower money to buy clothes for herself. And then she would wear house dresses and tan stockings with black lace-up shoes with Cuban heels. And she always wore a starched apron. One thing Pa did do for Ma, which she had to fight to get it the way she wanted, was to remodel the kitchen and put in a summer kitchen where the porch was. Now, for the summer kitchen, he put in concrete flooring and screened windows all around. And this is where Ma did her canning and her washing clothes and people and hog butchering. The kitchen remodel involved taking out the pantry, putting in cupboards and a sink, and then at later, a septic system to handle the waste flow. And they move the cupboard into the front of the room. So it made the kitchen much bigger. But Gladys missed the pantry. It was so handy for sneaking in and cutting off a slice of the crust. So crispy and good. Ironically, when Gladys had her own country kitchen. She also removed the pantry and put in cupboards and a laundry room. I guess she didn't let sentimentality get in the way of practicality. And I imagine she was getting tired of going into that cellar of a basement that she had. It was so spooky that they used it for uh, a haunted house on Halloween. Now this leads me to Christmas. This was the greatest time of the year for Gladys. The season began with a big program in their one room school. They had a play, a Christmas play and Santa Claus in a big tree and a stage set up with curtains that they made. Each one got a present because they had a, a time of drawing names. And then the teacher gave each one a box of candy and a gift. Sometimes Gladys would get sick with the nerves because she had so many lines to memorize. But even so, this was the happiest time for Gladys. 
in her life. Pa and Ma were a disappointment, though. They came, but they just sat there like statues, not making conversation, not even with each other. Gladys so wanted them to be part of it all, you know, the, the holiday atmosphere. And it made her feel left out. But Pa and Ma did their best to make Christmas special for them. They had a tree, which was put up in the living room. And all the kids had to stay in the kitchen with the door shut. And then at last, the door was opened. And they came into the living room to this tree, all lit up with real candles. And there was candy and cookies and nuts and presents. The kind of presents she got, Gladys remembered, were things like a pair of mittens or long winter underwear. But one year, she got a box of paints, a 10 cent paint set. And she thought she was in heaven. It's funny because it seemed like this gift was uh, connected to her destiny because later, it turns out, Gladys had real artistic talent. Us kids are always proud of her artwork. Here's one example that I have of a horse. And here's another example also including a horse, but a nice scene. And it, the same thing happened to me. My mom gave me a Christmas gift, this little Kodak camera that was connected to my destiny because I ended up going to China and using my newer Kodak camera to take pictures and send them back to my family. So... Here's some of those. This is a little pagoda in Guilin, China. This is a picture of a cockfight. But don't worry. They didn't fight to the death or anything, just until one of them fell off the stage. And this is a picture of some monkeys that I saw who helped their master earn some money taking pictures. And one year was special. Their family was given some used but expensive dolls, the kind that with eyes open and shut. And Ma put those aside and sewed clothes for them and blankets and pillows and bedding and you name it. And then she presented those to her daughters at Christmas. So the way that came about was because Gladys's older sisters were working for wealthy families. Um, Marcella worked for the Dr. Mortons and Hilary worked for the Mulbergers of the Miller Brewing family and Hyacinth worked for the key coffer who had a box factory. Sometimes Gladys would get to ride into town on their day off to pick them up and she would get to go into the house. Oh my, how the other extreme lived. For Gladys always called her family the poorest of the poor. It was like fairyland. They, their houses were mansions with carpeting and all. Carpeting was quite a luxury in those days. Ma would get scraps of it and piece it together and nail it down. And then she would just clean it by sweeping it. And the only piece of furniture they had in the living room was a rocking chair for Ma. Now they did have Pa and Ma's bed in there because 
they didn't get to use their bedroom until um, most of the children had grown up and moved out. Um, another thing Ma did was care for the sick. Well, this was a very important job because Pa hardly ever took anyone to the hospital, to the doctor. Once Miriam had appendicitis. Gladys was so scared. And all Pa could think about was how much money it was going to cost him. Another time, Laverne was upstairs for a whole week. She couldn't keep anything down. Finally, Pa went to see her. Gladys just was amazed that she didn't die. She had a fever for months. A lot of her hair fell out. Eventually, she saved up her babysitting money and bought some vitamins. And after about a year, she finally got well. Al got pneumonia twice, which Pa pulled him through. And what Ma would usually do would be to rub their chest with lard and turpentine. And then she would swab their throats with kerosene. It was worse than being sick. And the whole time someone was sick, Ma would have this strained look on her face. I was just impressed that all 13 of her children made it to adulthood. I mean, Fran lived until he was 101. Well, better days for Ma did come. When Gladys was 15, so that would have made Ma in her 50s, Ma got a job at the milk jug, washing dishes on the weekend. Miriam and Laverne worked there, and they got Ma in. So it was one of the times that Ma was happy. She was with people, and she had money to spend. She bought things for the house, linoleum for the upstairs, um, curtains, bedding, and clothes for herself, which she needed. Gladys always thought Ma was unhappy because she had this serious look on her face. Then Gladys noticed that she had that same look, even when she was feeling happy. And I've noticed that about myself as well. So I try to monitor my expression. One thing that puzzles me about Ma is why she scratched her face off the snapshots of the family in later years. It frustrates me and saddens me. Was she feeling left out? Was she feeling hurt or angry one day? Was it vanity? I mean, no one likes how they look on pictures. And age barely does justice to youth. Gladys said that she was sensitive and easily hurt. It tells me that Ma had low self-esteem. It also says that there was someone in there that very few got to see, even herself. So I hope my telling of her story shed some light on who Ma really was and helps us appreciate her more. One last story that I like to share, um, my only personal encounter with grandma was during the, the time right after I graduated from college, I was living with my dad and grandma Benzing came to spend the night. She had come into town for a wedding to, and we got a chance to um, talk in a more relaxed setting, getting ready for bed. And two things that impressed me from that time with her. One was how much underclothing she wore. I mean, for a young woman of the 70s, I was amazed at the amount, the 
girdle and the petticoats and slips and stockings. The other is a story she told me of how Pa once wanted her to make wine and she didn't have the proper equipment. So she had all these little pots and pans spread out over the kitchen. And so she had to taste a little bit from each one to see if it was ready. And she got tipsy. And she giggled at the memory and the telling. I mean, it wasn't her fault. She was obeying her husband. But I think she liked it. So that's Ma's story. I feel that I've grown closer to her by taking this look into her life. I can see where I get some things like her love of flowers and her sensitivity. One thing I didn't get was her hardworking gene. I take more after my mom in that respect. So goodbye. Grandma, I love you. What? You're still here? Grandma? There's something missing from your story? I know. I, I kept your secret. After all, you kept that secret for 68 years. You never told Pa, even when he called you a loose woman. You never told your in-laws when you lived with them after you first married, even though they treated you like dirt because they knew Al wasn't Pa's. You never told your daughters, not one. I guess the disgrace was easier to bear than the shame. That shame must have gone deep. You kept that secret and never told a soul until you were about to leave this world. And then you said three words, I was raped. You wanted the world to know that that first time was against your will. You're only 16. But what did you learn from all that, Grandma? Did you learn that in sharing your shame, it grew less and not greater? Well, that's a big lesson worth sharing. Now, your life didn't really turn out the way you planned, did it? But I think you can be proud of it. You left a legacy and an example that I would be proud of. I mean, when Gladys would see her brothers and sisters sitting there stoically, at a wedding with all the rock music around them and the dancing. She called them the salt of the earth. And she meant it. And that was partly your doing, Ma. And even Gladys came around by the end. They say that work is love in action. And you had that in spades. Isn't that what it's all about?